Um, so welcome everybody to the first um, semester of the Global Economy and Development Research Cluster. We're delighted to have Gregory Nain here today from the Econ Department of American University. We've been trying to get him to talk um, last semester, last spring actually, we had to cancel you for job talk. Um, so we're very happy it worked out this time and I would say you just go ahead and tell us about monitoring and target contracts, um, the results from the RCT in Kenya. Sure. Yeah, no, thanks uh, for having me. It's good to finally uh, uh, get here after a year of trying, <laughs> despite being in the same institution. Um, so yeah, so this is a project uh, that I have with two of my colleagues, Aaron Kelly at the bank and David Schoenholzer uh, in Sweden. Um, and what we're looking at is a, a you know monitoring uh, in a particular type of contract that we um, found in uh, Kenya. Let's see. Um, so, you know, the motivation that we had going into this prob uh, project was sort of thinking about uh, the problem of firm growth, and in particular, the difficulty that firms have um, incentivizing their employees to, to work hard, right? And so, you know, how well a firm does is going to depend heavily on how well their employees are performing, um, but it's particularly difficult to design contracts sometimes that, you know, properly incentivize employees to do that. Um, and then this problem uh, is particularly difficult if firms can't actually observe or monitor what their workers are doing, right? So this is your classic principal agent uh, problem. Um, but we think that this type of, you know, just your classic principal agent issue might partially explain low firm productivity that we see particularly uh, in low income countries. And, you know, just to get, make this very concrete, you know, if firms can't observe uh, how hard their employees are working, the effort they're putting in, this might result in lower revenue for the firm. Um, but in addition, if you can't observe the types of actions or the riskiness of those actions that the employee takes, this might uh, inflate your costs as well. And so, as I was saying, these types of, you know, classic agency problems we think might be worse in low income countries for a couple of reasons. The first is, is that these firms are typically going to be operating in a particularly low information environment where it's hard, particularly hard to observe actions. And in addition, it might not, it might be, uh, you know, hard to observe uh, employee actions uh, that they take, but it might also be hard to observe the output that employees produce, which adds another layer of um, complexity. Uh, in addition, the workers that you're going to have typically are going to be poor themselves, which introduces the problem of limited liability, which constrains the types of contracts that you can enter into with your employees. And finally, there's often going to be weak legal institutions, so you might not even be able to write a formal contract, or even if you do enforce that contract, which means you're typically going to have to rely on relational contracts, which is going to make this uh, problem even harder. So, you know, Eco, you know, core economic theory tells us that in theory, a monitoring device that reduces the asymmetric information between the principal and the agent can improve sort of outcomes and overall uh, efficiency and welfare in the system. Um, but in practice, we, you know, think that this may not actually be true, particularly in the types of contexts we're going to be looking at in low-income countries. Uh, so why might it not be true? Um, so first is, is that, you know, uh, firms themselves might not have the necessary managerial skills or expertise to properly use this information to incentivize their, their workers. Uh, secondly, the you know, weak legal institutions I was mentioning before might just mean that you know, you know what your employees are doing wrong, but you can't write a binding contract to change their behavior. Uh, and finally, you know, on uh, thinking about the worker side, if there are sort of weak legal protections, uh, we might be concerned that firms are actually going to exploit their workers using this information. And this might actually lead to lower aggregate welfare, even if the firm itself um, does better. Uh, and this is, you know, so it's ambiguous what we think this will work, and we don't actually have very much empirical evidence one way or the other. Uh, this is largely just because, you know, the decision to monitor employees by firms is not taken randomly. So, you know, we have this classic, uh, you know, uh, econometrics problem. Uh, but secondarily, and maybe even more importantly, um, it's just very hard to get the necessary data to really understand what's going on in these relationships. So you need high frequency data, both from firms, but maybe more importantly, from uh, employees themselves and their actions, which are sort of hard to observe by, you know, the nature of the problem. So how, what's our approach to actually trying to overcome uh, these issues? So first is we're going to randomize the introduction of a new monitoring device among firms. And then secondly, we're going to collect high frequency data, both from the firms themselves on a daily basis, but also from their employees also on a daily basis. 
So where do we actually do this? Um, so the setting we're going to be in is Kenya's uh, transit industry or the Matatu industry. So why did we choose this area um, as sort of a, a nice place or what we thought was a nice place to, to test this out? So first is it's an industry where we think moral hazard is prevalent and is a particular problem. So you have a classic principal agent relationship between the owner of the minibus, the Matatu, and the driver that they hire to drive throughout the day. And this driver is gonna have moral hazard along multiple dimensions. So they have moral hazard in how long they drive the bus, the effort they put in, but also the risk they take or the type of driving they engage in, sort of whether they take off roads or hit bumps or slam on the brakes all the time. Um, and then finally, there's an extra uh, dimension of moral hazard, which is that the drivers are the only ones that know how much revenue they brought in. And so there's moral hazard and how much of that revenue they report back to the owner. Um, so there's a lot of moral hazard here, and we think this is an industry that might plausibly be constrained by this problem. So we think this problem might be affecting firm growth. So the firms that we're dealing with and you observe in this industry are typically very small. So it's actually one owner owns one minibus. Um, and we, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that we think they might be more productive. You know, basically owners complain to us that this moral hazard problem is a problem. Uh, that it constrains how much profits they make and also prevents them from maybe expanding their business and becoming more efficient. Um, and finally, we thought this is a good place to come in because at the time we started this experiment, which is a very, at this point, a very long time ago, um, these monitoring devices were just becoming cheap enough to be a plausible uh, uh, investment by these um, uh, Matatu owners. And in subsequent years, actually, the uh, NTSA, the transit authority in Kenya has actually mandated, is starting to mandate that bus owners install these. And insurance companies have made it, almost all of them have made it a real rule that you must have one of these devices in your bus if you want to be insured by them. So, you know, right at the time when we are coming in, these changes are starting to uh, take place. We really thought it was a nice opportunity to try to understand what are the potential impacts of this type of policy change going to have on this relationship and um, uh, on potentially productivity. Okay, so what are the specific research questions we're really trying to answer here? So first is we wanna know how this monitoring device affects the contracts between the principal and the agent and subsequently worker behavior. So on the contract, we're gonna be thinking about the terms of that contract. Um, and on the worker side, we're gonna be thinking about the effort that the employee puts forth, but also the risk-taking behavior that they engage in. Um, secondly, we wanna think how do these technologies then affect sort of the bottom line for both firms and workers. So on the firm side, we're gonna be thinking about profits and firm growth. And on the worker side, we're gonna be trying to estimate uh, the welfare that they have from being employed. And we're concerned that this might be um, something that damages them um, uh, quite a bit. So Greg, what kind of contracts do they have? Is that written contracts? Is that an informal industry? So it's, it's informal okay. contracts and mm -hmm. often an excruciatingly long time going through this, <laughs> both uh, informally and then through a formal model. I see, okay, great. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, so the steps that we take in the paper, you know, with that these broad goals, is first we're going to model this contractual relationship that's prevalent in this industry, um, but also we found uh, interestingly in many other informal transit industries around the world in uh, Latin America, uh, in East Asia and Southeast Asia, um, and also in other uh, industries, particularly in ones that where output is unobserved. Um, we showed that this class of contract is inefficient from a social planner perspective, and then we show how it can be improved or potentially worsened with the introduction of monitoring. Uh, we then go ahead and we do our RCT. So we randomize the introduction of a monitoring device and we fit 255 buses um, in, with GPS trackers and provide those owners with a smartphone. Half of the owners that we did this with, we actually provide the information from the tracker to their phone via a, an app. Um, and then we collect for the whole sample daily data from both the owners and the drivers. So the, the system functions both as a way to our treatment and also as a data collection method. And then the last step that we do is we go and we go back to step one, we take the structure of our model, we take the data from the RCT, and then we structurally estimate the parameters of the model in order to back out welfare changes that are resulting from this introduction of monitoring. Okay, so I'm going to go a little bit more. Now you hopefully have a sense of the 
broad structure, go through the context a little bit more and describe uh, informally the contract, and then we'll go to the formal mechanics of it. So for those of you who don't uh, know what these look like, this is a Matatu. This is your classic 14-seater bus. Um, and all of the owners in our study own one of these uh, buses. You see in the background uh, bigger buses, which are also called Matatus, but none of those were um, in our, in our uh, study. Um, so how do these, you know, operate in, like, what is the role in Kenyan society? So, um, you know, like I said before, the owners are renting out these buses to drivers and the drivers are licensed to operate along one, only one designated route uh, in the city. And so the drivers drive up and down this route and there's not really a lot of designated stops for passengers to get on. So the drivers are like weaving in and out of traffic, trying to flag people in. And at least this huge, uh, very erratic um, driving style. And it's often seen as quite dangerous. Um, as the drivers are doing this, they're picking up passengers and the passengers are paying the driver in cash their fare. Um, and this is completely unobservable from, from the owner of the bus. Um, these, this is a very uh, important industry uh, in Kenya. So there's uh, approximately 20,000 of these buses operating in Nairobi alone and 120,000 in Kenya as a whole. Um, and they're really responsible for, you know, uh, most of the commuter traffic. So about 70% of commuters rely on Matatus on a daily basis. So sort of the wealth, the functioning of the system and the productivity of the system is sort of, you know, important from, you know, like a, a citywide perspective and a countrywide perspective. Sorry, before you move on, David had a question. Um, David, do you want to do you want to raise it? You can just unmute yourself. David, are you there? Um, he was asking if we should infer anything about driver behavior from the dirty uh, tricks and aggresso stickers. I don't know if, if they have. Uh, that wouldn't necessarily be a, a bad inference. Uh, yes, um, the Matatu culture is certainly an interesting one, as is uh, often expressed via these. Um, this was a very tame photo of the types of uh, <laughs> Matatus. A lot of the uh, Matatus you wouldn't actually want to put in a presentation uh, due to the um, decorations. OK, um, so. A, sorry, Greg. Uh, in a question about how this, you said it's 70% of commuters. Um, is there, the, the larger buses, are they also privately owned? Is there no public transportation system? And if so, how are they monitored or not? So there is no like government run uh, transportation system. The larger buses are operated in largely the same way. So individual private owners operating them. And the, you know, the, the government regulation is essentially about licensing. So you're licensed, you have to, you know, license for a route and they require you to belong to what are called SACOs. Um, the, yeah, there's no public buses. The, the closest thing that exists is there's one company that owns a very old fleet of buses that um, almost predated this system. Um, and they are, you know, it's the one company that sort of owns like a fleet of like 60 buses, um, but they are, it's still private and, um, but it's sort of its own animal that sort of is a legacy system almost. Um, okay, so this is just a map of all the routes um, of Matatus uh, in the city and you can sort of see how they're structured, you know, they're, you know, broadly designed to take commuters out on these uh, suburban areas and bring them into the downtown uh, central district, uh, central business district in the center of the map. Uh, um, this is an overlay of the nine uh, routes that we used in our experiment. So we tried to get a decent geographic spread of different types, you know, representative of um, sort of the, the system as a whole. Okay, so now I'm going to describe uh, the game that is the contract between the uh, driver and the owner sort of a bit informally, but just sort of to introduce the key terms and the steps of the game before I go through it um, a little bit more formally and we try to derive predictions. So how does this relationship work? So at the beginning of the day, the owner goes to the driver and they specify a revenue target that the driver is supposed to return to them by the end of that day. Uh, this is not exactly a fixed rental contract, which I'll try to highlight moving forward. So if the revenue the driver collects exceeds the target, the driver is the residual claimant. So they'll keep everything above that uh, target and they're supposed to give the full amount of the target to the owner. However, if the revenue the driver collects comes in below the target, the driver is supposed to transfer everything they earn to the owner 
um, and they're left with nothing, but they're not expected to cover the difference, right? So there's no expectation that if you have a bad day that's below the target, that you are sort of liable for the rest. Um, with this sort of target set at the beginning of the day, uh, the driver then goes out and they choose how long to work. So that's completely their choice. And they choose how to drive, right? The routes that they actually choose to drive on, the types of roads that they take, whether it's a paved road or bumpy, and the style of driving, whether it's safe or you know whatever. Um, it's important to note that any repair costs that come up throughout the day or at the end of the day, the driver is not responsible for paying. Those that fall fully on the owner. Um, and as I said before, they're not expected to make up any of this revenue difference. Um, so, you know, after the day's finished, the drivers collected all the revenue that they're going to collect. They come back, they meet the owner at the end of the day, and the driver makes a unilateral decision about how much of the revenue they earned to transfer to the owner, right? And so they can follow what the contract is supposed to require, or they could lie and not do that. That's their choice. Okay, so now that we should broadly understand what's going on, um, I'll go through the, the formal math and we'll think about you know, what the status quo model looks like and then how monitoring might affect this. Okay, so uh, we build a model here that has sort of five key features that play a role uh, in our prediction. So you know, the first step is fairly standard. We have your classic principle that cannot observe A's in choice and we have two choices here. We have effort, uh, little e, and risk, which is a broad category of the types of actions I was describing before, little r. Uh, both effort and risk are to, going to increase the amount of revenue that the um, bus brings in. However, only risk is going to increase future repair costs that the owner is responsible for paying themselves. In addition to sort of this classic you know, uh, worker choice problem, um, we're also going to have that the owner can't observe the amount of revenue that the agent collects either, this uh, variable little y. And so this is sort of uh, new in the literature where, you know, uh, these models typically assume that output is a common, commonly known, and here we, we're not going to have that. What this implies is that the only tool that the uh, agent has to induce transfers from the agent to them is uh, the rehiring probability, which can only take the argument for the only thing they observe, right? The transfer amount at the end of the day, right? So we define the rehiring probability, this function p, which takes as an argument little t, which is the daily transfer that happens at the end of the day. Um, and it, so this is the core setup. And then we also have um, limited liability on the agent side. And we're going to require that this be a relational self-enforcing contract. OK, so how do we go about solving this? So we set this up as a standard in the literature as an owner maximization problem where the owner is trying to maximize the expected transfers that the driver makes to them at the end of the day and the sort of future discounted value of the relationship moving forward. Um, while at the same time, trying to minimize the repair costs that they have to pay, which is a function C of the risk choice that the agent makes little r. So this is their, their objective function, but it's subject to four key constraints. So the first three are sort of fairly standard in these types of models. We have a participation constraint for the driver. So they have to be an expectation better off being employed. Uh, an incentive compatibility constraint along the choice of effort and risk. Uh, the limited liability constraint. And then this fourth constraint is sort of uh, new, um, and it's the transfer constraint. And this just simply says that the transfer the driver makes to the owner at the end of the day has to be incentive compatible from the driver's perspectives. And so the ones with the, the information. So we solve this model, um, and I won't go through the gory details, but it gives us, uh, first, it gives us two things, right? We are actually able to solve for um, the functional form of the rehiring probability. And so the rehiring probability turns out that it's a linear function of the transfer amount. And it's a linear function that increases up until the owner is rehiring the driver with certainty. And we define this point, this certain rehiring point, as the target amount. And so you can think about this key contract parameter that's set at the beginning of the day, the target, as implicitly being the owner telling the driver, if you give me this amount, you will be rehired with certainty for the next day. Anything below that, there's going to be some probability that you are fired. So given this linear uh, rehiring probability, we can think about what this implies for the driver's decision to transfer at the end of the day. 
And so this uh, second lower graph here shows the utility that the driver gets from making a transfer of any given amount to the owner. And you can see that it's a flat line. So there's basically the same utility for any transfer amount up until the target. And then it starts to fall after this. So what's the intuition of why we get this? Well, the specific slope of the rehiring probability the owner has chosen above has been chosen to make the driver exactly indifferent between giving a dollar to the owner at the end of the day versus keeping that dollar for themselves. And so just as a tiebreaker, we assume that they give the full amount if they're indifferent. Um, and so what this implies with this transfer schedule is that it gives a strong prediction of what we should see in the data. We should see transfers from the uh, driver to the owner increasing linearly with revenue up until the target amount, at which point we should see them leveling off uh, fairly flat. Um, so we can quickly just go to the data that we gathered from the control group to sort of check this prediction. And broadly, this is what we see, right? So we see the transfer amount here on the y-axis increasing linearly with revenue at until we get to roughly the target point, and then we have a leveling off. OK, so we have a functional form for the rehiring probability and the transfer schedule. So now we can think about what does this imply for the driver choice of effort and risk? Because that's ultimately you know, well, one of the key things we want to think about. So the driver, when they're choosing effort and risk, the first thing they're going to be doing is thinking about uh, their incentive compatible set. right? So this is just simply the set that uh, equalizes the ratio of the marginal benefit of effort and risk to the marginal costs of effort and risk from the driver perspective. right? So it's the tangency points of this benefit curve and cost curve of these different uh, amounts. And so we know then that the driver is going to be choosing a bundle of effort and risk along this black line here, this locus of points. And so you can think about the, when the driver is choosing what should I do today, they're going to be sort of searching up and down this line until they reach the point that maximizes their total return. And we're going to define that point as the driver bliss point or the point EDRD, right? It's what the driver is going to, would, is going to choose. Um, left to their own devices. So we now know what the driver is going to do or would like to do, but we can think about, OK, well, what about the owner? What would the owner prefer the driver to do instead? So uh, to think about that, I've left the driver incentive compatible set here, and I've just chosen an arbitrary driver bliss point EDRD right there. And now I've overlaid on this the owner ISO utility curves from different choices of uh, effort and risk, different bundles. And you know, the reason they have this C shape here is that um, you know, where darker blue is more utility for the owner is that from the owner's perspective, they always want more effort, right? Because more effort gives more revenue, which is going to increase their transfers. And there's no cost to effort from the owner perspective, right? They're not the ones working. So they prefer the driver to drive all day. Um, However, that's not true from the risk choice, where risk also increases revenue, so they want a little risk. But risk also is going to be uh, increasing repair costs, so there's a trade-off. And so um, with some really uh, not very strong assumptions on uh, the functional form of revenue output, we are actually derived that in this status quo model, the owner would actually prefer the driver to work less hard than they are going to choose by themselves. Right? So the owner optimal point on the incentive compatible set is going to fall below on both effort and risk the driver bliss point. So this is sort of was surprising to us when we got this because it's the opposite of the typical principal agent uh, issue that we typically think we have. Right? Classically, we think the principal wants the agent to work more than the agent is going to choose on their own. Here we have the opposite. The agent is working harder than the principal wants. The principal actually wants them to, to work less hard. In addition to that, it's um, actually impossible for the owner to achieve their preferred outcome. And in fact, the owner is stuck with this driver bliss point EDRD. They cannot disincentivize the worker from working as hard as they would want. Why? Well, to understand that, we introduce the fourth con uh, constraint in our problem, the transfer constraint. So the only tool that the owner has to change the incentives for the worker is this rehiring probability. So if they try to lower the incentives for the worker by lowering the slope of that rehiring probability, basically you know, saying, oh, don't worry about transfers, you'll be rehired, 
what they've done at the same time is they've gone ahead and violated the transfer constraint. So by lowering the incentives to work, they've simultaneously lowered the incentive for the driver to transfer money to them. And from the driver's perspective though, if they're not giving the dollar to the owner and increasing the rehiring probability, instead they're keeping that dollar for themselves. But the value of that dollar is exactly the same, right? So remember they were indifferent between giving it to the owner and keeping it for themselves. So the return to effort and risk from the driver's perspective hasn't changed at all. So by trying to disincentivize them, the only thing the owner has done has just stopped transfers that are coming to them and the driver is gonna make exactly the same optimal choice from their perspective. And so what this means is the only sets of points the owner can induce are the lowest they can induce is the driver bliss point and they can ramp up incentives, but they cannot lower incentives to work. So this is sort of um, the problem that we find ourselves in and we're sort of uh, turning this, um, this problem sort of a bit on its head. David just raised his hand, I think, and, th and then Walter, sorry. Go ahead, David. Am I, uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Ah, okay. I'm just curious, is there a sort of efficiency wage interpretation of this result? Uh, are drivers uh, receiving a rent on their information and afraid of losing the job for fear of losing the future stream of, of scarcity rents on their information? That's exactly right. So um, surprisingly, you know, they're, they have actually have quite a large um, information rent. Um, so we'll see that the, based on our model estimates, um, they have quite a large uh, welfare gain above their outside option. So uh, you, it, it, we think this is actually a pretty good job um, for someone of, uh, in Kenya of this, you know, they're basically unskilled, uneducated young men. Um, and so they are, in fact, they don't want to be fired because that's actually quite costly to them. Um, so yes, so uh, the monitoring device, in some ways, you know, it's eating into those uh, rents. Um, uh, but the reason they're willing to accept it is because it's still, even with uh, eating away the rents, this is still a, uh, a better job than they could get um, elsewhere. Walter, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, so, so Greg, uh, your capital T is held exogenous, right? No, the capital T is a, a choice parameter in the model. And so oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry, I meant I meant it's exogenous to the to the worker. So the owner can choose T. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so the okay, owner so, chooses cap T. The driver chooses little T. Yeah. yeah okay. Because it ultimately, uh, little E and little R are functions of capital T. And so couldn't the, because what I, th I feel is that the contract is flawed from the beginning in the sense that a large T encourages reckless behavior, right? Yeah. So perhaps the owner could, I mean, because the alternative is, is to just give the driver a percentage of revenues instead of saying, so here's the target T, I want you to reach oh. it. And then it's like Domino's pizza back, back way yeah. back when. <laughs> exactly, yeah, it arrives at your house all ruined. Um, but. Uh, I, I agree. And so these other contract types, so we were actually quite confused why they had settled on this type because we we're thinking like, why not a fixed rent? Why not a sharecropping? Like you said, it all boils down to the fact that this problem of output not being observed. See? So the classic sharecropping uh, type contracts that kind of get around this problem that sort of make the driver internalize, you know, the, these uh, things, um, it's not possible because only the driver is the one with knowledge of revenue. So if you say, hey, give me, you keep 20, I'll keep 80. The driver is going to be like, uh, okay, yeah, here's five bucks. That, that was 80%. I, I pinky swear. And the owner's just not going to believe them. And so they're left. Um, the only sort of tool the contract that solves sort of this problem with output in, isn't observed is surprisingly this, this target contract. Um, yeah, so... Uh, yes, but you're exactly right that like the tra those trade-offs that you were mentioning, the fact that larger T incentivizes more effort and risk that, you know, risk is not what the owners want is exactly the trade-off that these owners are making and when they're choosing what T to actually choose. Um, and that's why you don't see targets at, you know, super high levels. You actually see them uh, below sort of even, you know, roughly around average revenue. Um, so you'd think there'd be room for them to capture more, but the reason they're not, we think, is because it, it creates too large of an incentive for drivers to be crazy, which they don't want. 
Okay. Um, okay, so quick summary of this status quo model. Um, so we've got this contract where really the only tool the owner has to provide incentives is this rehiring probability based on the transfer. Uh, we have a transfer schedule where the driver is going to be transferring revenue to the owner up until the target. Um, and in terms of uh, effort and risk choice, the owner should resign to accepting this driver bliss point in the status quo, which means that there's more risk taking uh, going on than the owner would like. Um, and we also show in the paper that this contract is sort of inefficient from a social planner's perspective, um, because largely because of risk is being uh, oversupplied. Sorry, can I pause you once more, Greg? Um, Jeffrey just had a question. Jeffrey, would you like to unmute yourself or shall I, shall I say what you put in the chat? Well, I was just mostly wondering about the possibility that and I think maybe the geographic spread in the map that you showed explains it, but I was wondering if it's possible that the unobservability uh, assumption might be a little bit undermined by social networks or information signals sent from other drivers or other owners back to the owner if one of the drivers is slacking off and, pay, and underpaying at the end of the day, shirking. Yeah, so um, we the owners typically are, are, as you sort of suggested, actively trying to eat away at this information rent, right? They are trying to get signals. We kind of hand wave that away just because it doesn't change our prediction whether you have a noisy signal or you have no information um, about output but owners do uh call people along the route and they ask hey did you see my bus drive by how many times did it drive by did it look like they had people in the thing uh, in the bus um uh the drivers though are aware that this is going on and so the drivers have counter information networks as well oh so God. there's there's <laughs> large you know degree of complexity here that we're not trying to model um but we think that we're sort of still capturing the key component but they could still assimilate that information and then set their target the next day lower there can still be driver specific targets in your model is that correct yes yeah there's okay. and there is driver heterogeneity we, for simplicity okay. we have homogeneity of drivers um but uh anecdotally there is definitely you know you set a target for the driver you have okay uh, thank you very much David, do you want to mention your point too? You can just unmute yourself. Yeah, I just. Oh. You unmuted yourself, David. Can you unmute? Damn. <laughs> I'm going to get this yet. Uh, sounds like it might be a, a possibility for yardstick competition too. Is that a possibility? You could compare performances across drivers and, and give compensation on a relative basis? So, um... I, I think that's true. And actually, in the one large bus company that I was talking about before, this legacy company, they, in fact, do that. Um, the reason we don't see that here is just because the owners um, are all small. So, you know, every single person in our experiment only has one bus driver. And so, you know, they do ask each other, you know, largely, uh, you know, they, they owners do get together and ask and compare. Um, but it's very hard because, you know, they don't know the quality of the buses. So, you know, how fancy the buses, those stickers that we saw are a big factor in the revenue you get. So, you know, there's a lot of, you know, it's hard to isolate exactly like how, uh, what's optimal for my driver based on information from other owners that you don't know all the, the details. Um, okay. Okay, so really quickly, I'll just summarize uh, what monitoring does to this model. Um, it, sort of what we think it's going to be doing. So we, uh, the introduction of monitoring is going to reveal the uh, agent choices of effort and risk to the owner, but is not going to reveal why. And so this, uh, the output that's produced. And so this mimics exactly what our monitoring device we think it does and most monitoring devices on the market do. Um, and what this allows the owner to do is change their rehiring probability, the arguments of it, to include those choices, effort, and risk, instead of just being limited to this transfer amount before. And so practically, what does this mean? It means the owner is no longer constrained to that incentive compatible set, that black line we were talking about before, but instead can move off of it. So they can incentivize or contract, force the driver to choose a new bundle of effort and risk that is higher effort and lower risk. So um, what are the predictions then we get that we should see uh, from this monitoring device? So directly from what I just said, we're going to expect that we're going to see effort go up and risk to fall. So we should see lower repair costs. We actually get an ambiguous prediction on the revenue. So it may rise or fall. And this is simply because more effort is going to increase revenue, all else equal, but lower risk will decrease revenue, all else equal. Um, 
And we are going to expect uh, profits to go up largely because, you know, the owner is only going to accept lower revenue if uh, expected profits have fallen by more. But so profits should unambiguously rise. Uh, on the parameter of the contract, uh, this target, we get a prediction that if revenue is either flat or falls, so sort of weekly drops, we're going to predict that the target is falling. And so the intuition here is actually that the owner, by making the driver worse off, by either changing the bundle of effort and risk away from this incentive compatibility set um, or lowering revenue, um, they've made the driver worse off. And so they need to compensate them by lowering the target. Um, and then the fifth prediction actually surprised us as well is we actually get an ambiguous aggregate welfare effect. So the owner is unambiguously going to be made better off. So the owner likes this. But what happens to the driver is ambiguous. So the driver can actually be made better off from this device, which we found surprising. So it's possible that the driver likes this as well. But it's also possible, which is maybe your, everyone's intuition, that they're made worse off. And it's possible that they, they're made worse off by a greater amount than the driver is made better off. So from even from a society societal standpoint, it's not clear that this is even optimal. Um, and so, you know, obviously we can't, you know, capture in our survey uh, welfare, but we're going to try to answer this with our, our structural model. Okay, um, how much time do I have? 22 minutes. Yeah, you have 22 minutes. Okay, I'm going to speed up uh, now that we're through the model. Right. Um, so uh, the actual monitoring device that we uh, built, we built specifically, we built it ourselves for this industry, and it has a GPS device, a 3D accelerometer. It measures exactly how long the vehicle was operating and how uh, far. And so we spent a lot of time making sure this worked for the industry itself. So all the buses in our study got this device and all the owners in our study got an Android, the only uh, Android phone. The only difference between treatment and control was that the treatment group had an app that gave information about the location and productivity of their bus, where the control group, the app was only a data collection device. It did no information about their bus. This is what it looked like. It was a little black box. Um, and this black box we put inside the bus, so inside the dashboard. And we had to put it there because otherwise it was subject to being stolen and or destroyed. Um, so all our buses went inside. Um, and the app that the owner got had a uh, looked like this, and it had a bunch of key features. So the thing that the owners loved the most was the map feature. So this showed in real time um, where the bus was at any given moment. But even more importantly, they reported that this feature, which was the historical location, helped a lot. So they can put in any two points in time, date and time, and the app would actually draw exactly where their bus had been, right? So they can go back and check on any day what exactly where their, their driver went. Um, we also gave them information on safety alerts. So the device had built-in algorithms to generate things for speeding or sharp braking or uh, sharp turning. So we, we gave them that list. And then we had a final page, which was a summary productivity tab, which showed how long they were on the road, how far they drove. And then we tried to aggregate their safety performance um, to try and encourage owners to curb that kind of behavior. Okay. Ask a question yeah. uh, for the control group, knowing that this thing is installed, would that mean that they might still drive different to how they normally would without that? Yeah, so we can't. They feel they're being watched. Yeah, so unfortunately, due to the nature of this type of experiment, we mm -hmm. can't. Uh, well, there are certainly possible Hawthorne effects, right? So, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, it's impossible to to know that because you can't gather this data unless you monitor people, um, and we had to tell everyone that they were being monitored due to ethical mm -hmm. reasons. Um, so yeah, so so you want to be thinking about as the measures we're getting and not as necessarily like the baseline, but the gap between treatment and control should still be just the information gap because all treatment owner uh, drivers and control drivers got the same information, saw the device going in and were well aware that something had changed that was gathering data. So the only difference is what the owner can impose in terms of what they're telling their driver. Do you have historical data of how they used to drive before for these drivers? No? Not, not in the level of detail. Um, uh -huh. Just mm -hmm. because as soon as the as soon as the device went in, we had to tell them that we were. Sure. Yeah, of course. Um, 
So the data sets that we're using are we have the daily surveys from the owner. So we're collecting the target they set, the income, the transfers they got, and the a generalized rating of the driver. The driver, we're asking them their total revenue, the amount of money they walked home at the end of the day, and whether or not they got fired. Uh, we have the tracking device data, which is giving us things like speed, acceleration, location, and all these safety alerts. Uh, and then we also have sort of, you know, more standard phone surveys at a monthly uh, and an end-line basis where we're sort of gathering more qualitative data. Um, this is just sort of like, you know, an illustration of what some of this data looks like. So this is from our, our uh, device data, the 30-second uh, panel. And this is uh, a heat map of where our device for one bus said it was driving. Uh, no, this is not one bus, it's one route. Um, and so you can see, you know, the dark blue, uh, where the, these buses were most sort of map out on this road. And if you overlay their licensed route, you can see that this is in fact where they were supposed to be driving. So that's comforting. Um, but what I wanna highlight is that uh, these buses are not always driving along their route. And in fact, they're often taking roads like this one here, sort of off, can you see my cursor? Okay, this one here, which is, um, a bypass road, which is completely unpaved, that drivers like to take when this stretch here is backed up with traffic. So there's a, a Ford here, um, which often gets really slow. And so drivers will take this one to speed up the route. However, this is bad news from the owner's perspective because this route is really, really bumpy. I've unfortunately gone on it more than I'd like, and it completely destroys the shocks of the vehicle. And so the owner would actually prefer the driver just sit in traffic to avoid this, but of course the driver doesn't pay for shock repair. So they're always going to do this as long as they know they can get away with it. Okay, so this was just like a little preview of what we might expect to see change. <laughs> um, okay, what about results? Um, <clears throat> so uh, I'm just gonna show you some uh, sort of the, the most basic results we have, um, which are the result of this uh, fairly standard regression. So all our outcomes we're uh, reporting or capturing on a daily basis. Um, we're allowing the treatment effect to vary by month of our study. So this is a treatment indicator that we allow to, you know, beta to vary by month. And we do this because we expect there to be learning, right? Because, you know, the owners are figuring out what to do with this information. It takes time for them to get their driver to change. So we're, all our regressions are going to show six dots that are sort of the treatment effect over the course of the study. Uh, we have day fixed effects, we have route fixed effects, and we control uh, for characteristics of the, the bus that the owners own. All right, Greg, could you clarify how you measure productivity? So the productivity are going to be things like profits, revenue. Um, so it's sort of uh, the, the core thing we care about are revenue and profits. There are other things you, we, that we should look at the paper. It's sort of output per hour, like these uh, more um, uh, sort of uh, constructed variables. But for right now, I'm just going to show you revenue and profits. And, sorry. And in terms of what the, um, the people who are taking the Matatu. Are they paying a fixed fee? Are they paying per time they're on or length they go just in terms of as, as I'm a driver thinking about how much I yeah. drive people and my revenues? So, so there, it's a, it's not a fixed fee, but it's a fixed, roughly a fixed distance fee. So if you get on at a certain point in the route, you know exactly how much you have to pay to get to the central business district, regardless of how the driver actually gets there. So um, from the driver's perspective, they can maximize revenue um, by just going as fast as possible. So there's no sort of taxi cab incentive where you'd actually prefer to like really, you know, draw it out and like take this long route. Um, uh, because, you know, if you, if you move more people, you're going to make more money. Uh, there's, we're not exactly how, sure how these norms of prices get set, but they're fairly clear and everyone understands them. And, and for example, um, you had said 14 passengers. Is, there, is, is part of the risk being assessed not just to the uh, bus, but could you pack on extra people if they're willing to sit on laps or, okay. Yeah, and that, that happens. And in fact, not only sitting on laps, but hanging out the door yeah. is like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. I've, so, I've uh, seen the same thing in Brazil. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, the Brazilian system, I imagine, has many of these same features. 
Okay, so what do we actually see? So uh, I'm just going to go through the predictions, you know, the predictions I highlighted in the model. We have more stuff in the paper, but this sort of is the broad summary. So the first thing that we want to see is the change in the risk and effort uh, chosen. And so uh, we can't actually observe riskiness itself, but we can observe the output of riskiness, which is repair costs. And so what we observe is that over the course of the study, the repair costs in the treatment group fall by quite a large amount until by the last three months of the study, um, they're about $2 per day lower in the treatment group than in control group. So that's about a 40% decrease in the amount of repair costs these treatment drivers are, are paying. So this is quite a large um, reduction. Um, so I sort of hinted in that uh, uh, graph that we think that the key margin, and this is based on anecdotes as well, which has prompted us to look at this, um, the key margin that owners are actually changing is where their drivers are, are driving, and in fact, discouraging drivers from driving off the route on unpaved roads. So here we have the distance to the licensed route that the Matatu is on average, and so treatment buses on average are around 200 to 300 meters closer to where they're supposed to be, where they're licensed to be than control owner. So this is sort of the first sort of anecdotal evidence or not anecdotal, but suggestive evidence that, you know, this movement back towards the route um, is sort of what the owners are moving. Um, you know, in addition, we can, you know, if, these, if this is actually true that this is reducing wear and tear on the bus, well, we have acceleration data on the bus. So we can look at sort of measures of acceleration that are indicative of bumpiness, sort of wear and tear. And so here, this is vertical acceleration. As you want to think about, the bus really shouldn't be having a lot of ver vertical acceleration unless it's hitting a bump, right? And you can think like, do, 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 like when you hit uh, a, a pothole. And so here's the distribution of vertical acceleration and zero is what you want to have. That's not going up and down. And you can see the mass in the treatment group at zero is much larger than the mass in the control group. So this is suggestive that whatever changes the owners are inducing the drivers to do in terms of where they drive is actually reducing bumps. So this is sort of, you know, supportive evidence that, you know, this change in repair costs is being driven by owners inducing their drivers to change driving behavior. Uh, Do you also have something for being stuck in traffic if you say that they end up going on that slow so, route? Yeah, so um, we observe this. Uh, so we have, I'm, I don't have the results in the presentation, but we do look at sort of like speed. Um, it's a little hard to isolate, but there is suggested evidence. There are more observations during the day when treatment buses are at zero than control buses, but it's a tough, it's a noisy outcome to measure. Uh, largely because, as this graph is showing, the amount of time that buses are on the road is going up. And so this is uh, by sort of the end of the study, treatment buses are actually driving almost a, a full hour or more than a full hour longer than control buses, which um, from a societal standpoint, maybe actually isn't that great because if you look down here at the control mean, so Control buses are already driving about 15 hours a day. So treatment um, buses are driving almost 16 hours a day. So um, if you think that safety is getting worse as people are driving longer, this is actually uh, not a good sign. Um, so we see the predictions that we expected, Re uh, risk decreasing, effort increasing, Revenue, uh, we had an ambiguous prediction. And in fact, we find that basically nothing substantial changed. Revenue is actually staying flat uh, by and large. Um, and this means that we should maybe see a weak reduction in the target, which is in fact what we see. So uh, we don't get statistical significance um, in the target falling. But if you take our point estimates seriously, this we see a, a reduction in the target by about 115 shillings or $1.15 per day. Um, so this is at least suggestive evidence that the contract uh, parameter is in fact moving the way uh, you would expect based on what we observe happening to the effort, risk, and revenue. Uh, finally, we can look at uh, profits. Uh, the firm uh, is earning, uh, and it's a little bit noisier than our other estimates. But you know, if you look at the, the last three months here, there's sort of a broad uh, statistical increase in uh, profits earned, which are about an increase of uh, $3 per day uh, profits being earned, being driven uh, uh, 
almost entirely by that very large reduction and repair cost that we observed. Okay, uh, and then finally we can look at sort of, you know, extensive margin things which we uh, capture uh, at end line. Uh, and we have some evidence that this treatment did in fact allow treatment uh, owners to expand more quickly than control owners, right? So everyone in our study started with one bus, right? That was uh, what we started with. Um, but by the end of the study, uh, we actually have treatment uh, owners increasing uh, their fleet size um, by more than control owners. So about 11% uh, increase in the fleet size relative to control. Okay. Um, so those are the reduced form results, but can I ask one more question. Sorry, before yeah. you move on, um, Greg. So you had talked about the extensive margin as adding a new vehicle uh, for yeah. the. I know that a given driver, it sounds like, is working for about fifteen to sixteen hours. Is the bus just um, down for the rest of the hours? They don't have some allocation across drivers or no? No, it, uh, they literally call it putting it to sleep. So there's okay. parking lots That's where all these matatus go and you put your bus to sleep um, for the for the night, um, largely just because there's very little commute, like there's just the demand. Not a lot of commuter traffic in those extra Yeah, hours, so, so once you hit midnight, basically, you know, like on weekends, they'll, they'll work until like 1 a.m. But uh, in the wee hours of the morning, no one's driving or no one wants to go home. And there's one more question from Sharas. Please go ahead, Sharas. Uh, sure. Uh, actually, I think Dr. Simpson's hand was raised before me, but if you don't mind, I'll go ahead. Um, <clears throat> I, I wanted to ask this question earlier, but I missed that spot and I didn't want to wait until the end. So um, a little off topic of what you were just talking about over here. But uh, I was curious as in, um, like I haven't been to Kenya, I don't know the, the, the cultural nuances between the relationship between the drivers and the owner. Um, and w what's sort of, sort of like the, 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 the trust relationship there. But I, I was thinking of um, the uh, transportation um, sector in Karachi that's very similar, have very similar challenges. But oftentimes there's uh, just in general, like a business culture in, in Pakistan and in the informal sector is the owner just sort of uh, puts all their trust on the employee. And uh, there's not like, if you introduce like a, like a specific uh, official contract or um, um, ask them to like, you know, like monitor that like we're going to install this device, you might have like the driver, for instance, that would be really bothered or, or they might be irked or they think that, you know, the owner doesn't trust them. Right, and right. in this case, you might not get the best drivers in town, let's say, or from the network of drivers that you know, if you're a bus, bus owner. So um, I was wondering if there's any like cultural nuances like that, that you had faced uh, when you wanted to introduce this device and how did you come um, like sort of overcome that issue? Yeah. yeah. So the, the issue of trust is actually important. So in Kenya, they actually have quite an adversarial relationship where this, the baseline is very little trust. And so the reason we, you know, got into this is we were interested in originally just we, you know, in the safety of this, the system. But as we talk to owners, they're like, oh, well, the real issue is like those drivers and, and we can't trust them. And they'll, they'll, you know, if you give them a mint, she'll take them a mile kind of thing. Um, but this issue actually in other contexts, actually in the long distance trucking routes, which we've also looked at, um, this issue of trust is there. And so what you'd be concerned about is I think, you know, to put what you said in a different way, is that sort of formal contracts or formal monitoring are going to crowd out intrinsic informal relationships that are already solving this problem to a little bit of a degree, and you might actually get a backfire effect. And there's actually another researcher who looked at long distance trucking in Liberia, where she has anecdotal evidence that this is true, that monitoring devices actually reduce um, effort because they, she thinks it might be a tit for tat um, punishment by the driver who feels like they had their trust, you know, like you violated our well-functioning informal relationship. Uh, we don't get that here, we don't think, because the baseline level of trust is quite low. Um, and we actually have anecdotal evidence that trust increased. And so among treatment owners, uh, we, we play a trust game at N-Line and treatment owners actually, uh, you know, through revealed preference, actually trust their drivers more than control owners. So in some sense, we think we're, we're improving even the informal underlying relationship um, uh, as well. Okay, uh, in a very quick amount of time, I'm gonna go through the structural uh, estimation. Yeah, um, so uh, 
the reason we do this is, you know, one, we want to violate, you know, validate that our model actually makes sense. Uh, so we sort of match it to to the control data, but then sort of more importantly, we want to try to quantify sort of these unobserved welfare changes, particularly on the worker side. Um, so uh, really quickly, you know, we're doing a classic uh, GMM exercise. Um, so we're using the data in the control group, and we're getting estimates of average repair costs. We're getting the revenue distribution, and then we have three unknown models, uh, parameters in the model, driver disutility, firing costs, and outside option, which we sort of search over and we match, uh, use this uh, search to match five observed moments in the data, which are the target, expected profits, expected salary for the driver, separation probability, and um, uh, uh, driver uh, contract value. Um, we use this then to estimate sort of uh, welfare and uh, value for the owner, and we use sort of a bootstrapping procedure to generate uh, standard errors. Um, so in this sort of, this is like the model validation exercise, it's over identified, so we can actually formally test the model and we sort of get a, a very good fit. Um, and you can sort of see that, you know, using the model to optimize this system, we actually are able to recover something that looks pretty much like what we observe in the control group, right? So we almost perfectly match the optimal target. So Walter, what you were saying is like this very complex trade off of like the incentives that you're giving. Surprisingly, it looks like the owners are doing this pretty well, right? They, they understand these trade offs quite well and it looks like what they're choosing is close to the optimum. Um, and we're able to match fairly closely the expected profit and expected salary that we actually observe happening. The one parameter that we don't do so well on is firings. The model thinks there should be more separations that we actually observe, um, but pretty much everything else is, is good. Um, you know, we, we, we get value for the owner and total welfare, which we then, so this is the, the benchmark that we then compare to what changes when we introduce monitoring. So in the, uh, to evaluate monitoring, we then take data from the treatment group and we follow pretty much the same procedure with a few differences. Uh, the main difference is that we're leaving fixed some of the control group parameter estimates, namely firing costs and the outside option for the driver, since we don't think those should change from our intervention, which leaves us just with one unknown parameter to search over, which is the new driver disutility that they have now that they're forced to drive some different bundle of effort and risk, right? Their disutility is changing. We don't know how much. Um, we sort of search over this parameter and we're again matching on uh, uh, several uh, moments that we observe in the treatment data. We use this to estimate uh, changes in welfare and we bootstrap uh, this procedure to get confidence intervals. So uh, uh, what do we see? Well. We uh, get pretty good fits, but not as well as the status quo model for our predicted treatment effects that we should see in the data, right? So our model is essentially uh, simulating monitoring and telling us what, we sh what it expects to observe, what we would expect to observe in our experiment. Um, so we get pretty much exactly the target treatment effect that we actually observed in the RCT, which actually kind of surprised us. So, the target change is exactly what you would expect based on the changes in uh, repair cost revenue distribution. Um, we, the model thinks that the owners actually shouldn't be increasing their profits quite as much as we observe them increasing. And we uh, the drivers should actually be doing better off than we observe them, right? So in reality, it looks like this is more of a transfer to, to the owner um, from the driver than the, the model uh, expects. Um, but, you know, that aside, you know, if you take this as sort of, you know, just a rough estimate, um, the model thinks that monitoring uh, is reducing driver uh, welfare by about $30, increasing owner welfare by about $40. So a total uh, welfare gain of about $10, but it's pretty noisy and, you know, uh, not sort of super far away from zero. So, you know, in our simulation, um, uh, this seems like it's sort of a weak, uh, good thing for society, but it's not a slam dunk, and it involves a pretty large transfer away from the worker uh, to the owner. Uh, so we're not in the scenario where both parties are benefiting, um, and we're maybe probably not in the scenario where society as a whole is worse off, um, but we're not too far away from that either. Um, right, so, you know, what is what are their conclusions broadly from the structural uh, estimation? We think actually our model does a pretty good job here. Uh, we are pretty pleased with it. Um, and you know, monitoring the simulation of monitoring shows that this is sort of a weekly good thing. 
Um, and but it should have demonstrates, I think, that there's reason to be concerned that you know this monitoring device, which theory tells us should be unambiguously good, actually might not be in some of these cases. Uh, so we have to be a little careful. Um, but you know, pushing back on that on the other side, you know, this is bringing up. Uh, sorry, I forget uh, who asked the question. Your name, but um, sort of the uh, sort of the non-pecuniary uh, value or uh, you know relationship between the the driver and the owner. And there's some evidence, as I mentioned before, that this is actually improving. That might be sort of compensating the driver maybe a little bit for their lost contract value. Um, and this is largely because it seems like the owners and drivers are getting along better. So there's more trust and the drive, both the drivers and owners say that they like the device. So we were surprised when the driver said this. And the reason that they gave us anecdotally is that when they come back at the end of the day and they maybe haven't made the target, they feel like they can say like, look, I did my job. I drove how you told me to, it was just a bad day. And you can look and verify I'm telling the truth. So they don't feel like they're in this adversarial relationship where they're being questioned and they're being yelled at as much because there's a way to verify each other's actions. And so that sort of reduction in conflict, increase in trust may be uh, important here because you know this loss in driver value was not reflected in our qualitative evidence. Um, so it's a complex story. Yeah. And so that might then translate into a lower firing probability since they can get exactly. right, so they know. And so, so I guess that then affects again the, you know, the calculations for the driver since they know even if I have a bad day, I'm not going to lose my job. I can continue doing this. So, so perhaps that offsets them for the, for the loss. But so essentially they're driving longer to make sure they get enough money. Exactly. So the, you know, they're, they're driving longer because they can't do these shortcuts that mm -hmm. cut the driving time before, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and so you know, it's, that's essentially what's happening. Yeah, you're, you're adding an hour of stuck in traffic time. Um, yeah, so that's the, 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 that's all we've got, or at least all I'm able to show you. Um, so, you know, broad summary, you know, like the, uh, you know, we show how monitoring technologies impact uh, firms and in particular this public transit industry we think is um, important. Uh, we are hopefully sort of exploring a, a type of contract that hasn't been studied before, but it's actually prevalent in a lot of low-income countries that you know, uh, we think is inefficient um, and show how monitoring devices may be able to improve it, but maybe not, um, and how it might improve welfare, but maybe not. Um, uh, you know, it sort of you know, raises questions you know, that these monitoring devices might help firms grow. So this could actually be a solution for SMEs, um, but you know, if we're concerned about worker welfare and uh, particularly in countries that have poor labor productions, this is something that we need to consider seriously. We don't wanna just stop at looking at firm growth and firm profits if um, you have basically you know, labor abuses that go along with this. Um, and you know, anecdotally, we think this might explain other interventions in the same space that failed. So there was an effort by Google to introduce cashless payments, which uh, we would model as revealing the output Right, that it all out, all these uh, passengers' payments are logged, um, and there that failed because the drivers refused to implement it. They sabotaged the system because it completely eroded their their rents. It, it made you know it really harmed them uh, their their take home pay. Um, yeah, so uh, that's sort of uh, the conclusion. So, uh, any last questions? Wonderful. Thank you so much. I think David had a few questions. You've been posting in the chat. Do you want to? something wrap up uh, I, I i put them in the chat so really great presentation fascinating stuff greg thanks very much I really appreciate it thank you cool. any final thoughts otherwise we've gone over but this was well worth it i just want to thank you for the presentation sorry jennifer just uh sorry if you were about to talk um and i uh, had a question how was the user interface of the app for owners who were operating multiple vehicles because how was that? Yeah. Oh, so we, we, um, that was one of the reasons we, we actually, uh, we only worked with owners who had only one vehicle. And so if they, through the course of the study, added another vehicle, we did not install a tracker in their other vehicle. So okay. uh, it was optimized just for one thing. Subsequently, we have worked with um, other, uh, in another setting where owners did have multiple vehicles. And so the way we did that is you could toggle, we, you had a, a list of your license plates that were fitted. And so you could toggle between the different 
because I'm what I'm getting at is reducing the cost of information, right, for owners who want to own multiple vehicles. Exactly. The app itself. So, uh, we actually, you know, we're we're trying to work with the government in Kenya to actually uh, test something like this, where you know, thinking about, you know, basically this allowing firms to grow in term and get gains from from you know size. Um, you know, largely, yeah, it makes managing much, much easier, as you said. Thank you so much. Eras, you want to quickly go, perhaps with a final yes. word? Yes, uh, to your point, you just mentioned about uh, introducing the government um, to, um, to to try to impose this or try to introduce this. Do you think that would um, lessen, like, the sort of um, the um, encouragement from the, from the owners to... Um, uh, because if they don't want to get tracked by the government, like how much their the, the the bus is making or how much taxes they have to pay, yeah. Um, so that's a good point. Uh, so exactly what gets shared uh, with the government uh, when uh, is a big point of contention. Um, so and it's a negotiating point, as you said, owners aren't super excited about reporting revenue directly to the uh, the government. Uh, typically, what seems to uh, be the equilibrium is that safety data is being shared with the government and the owners are kind of okay with that largely because when you know they they don't like the perception you know they would like to change the perception that this uh, industry is very unsafe um, and things like revenue and other things are not being shared um, largely and that seems to be sort of a, an equilibrium um, you know the Kenyan government seems to be leveraging COVID as a way to ram this through as well. Um, so they were able to impose, uh, which no one thought would be possible, but has been successful, uh, you know, passenger occupancy limits in the tattoos. And so they did this by increasing the number of police traffic stops uh, by a lot. Um, and, you know, subsequently, you know, there's also an increase in bribe giving, but it actually has reduced um, passenger uh uh, the number of passengers vehicles and so sort of this increased control and increased checks that they have now on the system they are now using this to uh, introduce more regulation and they now have the tools to enforce it a bit better wonderful well thank you so much greg um thanks for a great presentation and um we'll put it on the sharepoint um so everybody can review it in a later great. point thank you. wonderful thank you so much